All right, um, we might as well begin. Uh, it is a great delight uh, for me to welcome uh, each and every one of you uh, to this round table on the ICC prosecutor selection process, a post-mortem. My name is Charles Jallo. I am a professor of law at Florida International University in Miami and the founder of the Center for International Law and Policy in Africa, or SILPA for short. Uh, before joining academia, uh, about 12 years ago, I practiced law in the Canadian Justice Department in Ottawa and did what my good colleague Elena Bellis at Pitt calls tribunal hopping, uh, working at the Special Court for Sierra Leone in Freetown and then subsequently in the Rwanda Tribunal in Arusha. I have the great privilege of also being a member of the International Law Commission. Uh, most pertinent, of course, for our discussion today, though, is that I served on the ASP's panel of experts on the election of the ICC prosecutor and was honored uh, to be asked to be its chair. Um, as a convener of this discussion today, together with the American Society of International Law and the Nuremberg Academy, the two co-sponsors of this event, our goal is to have a transparent and public dialogue as was set out in the concept note for this event about the public aspects of what was in many respects an innovative process uh, with the view to identifying, at least in a preliminary fashion, some potential lessons that ICC stakeholders, especially the state's parties, could perhaps consider if they see fit for possible benefit to the future ICC prosecutor elections processes. Uh, one had the feeling that due to the fact that the process was new, uh, there was considerable misunderstandings and in some cases uh, speculations uh, about it. Uh, by way of introduction, let me just say a word uh, about SILPA since we're a new entity. SILPA is a young, uh, independent and nonpartisan think tank that is based in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, while I invite you to read more about us on our website, if you are interested in learning more about us, I can briefly share that our principal goal is to contribute to advancing the discourse and building bridges between research, policy, and practice on issues of international law, but also issues of regional law, uh, whether uh, concerning the EU or otherwise and potentially their roles as vehicles in advancing peace, stability, and security and development on the African continent. So at SILPA, international criminal law will be one of our priority research areas, especially through our Africa ICC research project. The reason for this, of course, is a bit obvious in that this area of law is quite significant uh, for African states. And naturally, when you talk about accountability for international crimes these days, uh, you cannot but talk about the African uh, continent. So today's event reflects our interest and hope in launching a series, a four-part series uh, that we're calling the ICC Colloquium Series that will focus over the next several months on topics that we believe are critical for both African and other states parties to the ICC and perhaps even the ICC itself. But before we move to the program, let me invite uh, Mr. Klaus uh, Rackwitz, the director of the Nuremberg Academy, who would share some welcome remarks. And I will start by introducing him. Mr. Rackwitz is a German lawyer who studied law at the University of Cologne, and upon graduation was appointed as a judge in 1990 where he presided over criminal and civil cases at courts of first instance and at courts of appeal. He has extensive experience, uh, but perhaps particularly worth highlighting here is that from 1996 until 2002, he worked at and later headed the Division of Information Technology in the Ministry of Justice of North Rhine-Westphalia. His acumen in using modern technology for courts uh, led to his engagement in the advanced team of the International Criminal Court in The Hague in 2002. Uh, subsequently, from January 2003 until about September 2011, he was a senior administrative manager in the office of the prosecutor, 
responsible for all administrative and support matters. Uh, Mr. Rackwitz's uh, brief welcome remarks will be followed by those of Mr. Wes Rist, who is the Deputy Director of the American Society of International Law. Uh, Mr. Rist is the, uh, currently uh, with ASIL. He joined ASIL in 2012 and supervises the Society's educational programming, including its annual and media meetings, as well as its various interest group and signature topic programs. He works on issues of atrocity prevention and international criminal justice in the field of international law and has done briefings for the US Congress, conducted research and led trainings. He is a member of the Prevention and Protection Working Group, the Washington Working Group on the ICC and the advisory board of the ABA's uh, Atrocity Prevention and Resp Response Project. So let me now uh, invite Mr. Rakpitz to give his welcome remarks on behalf of the Nuremberg Academy and then, of course, Mr. Riss would follow him immediately thereafter. Mr. Rackwitz, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Charles. And uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone listening uh, to us. Uh, my particular thanks go to uh, Charles for convening this round and setting up uh, uh, this round table to discuss. Well, maybe a few words on the, on the uh, Nuremberg Academy, the International Nuremberg Principles Academy is a foundation uh, we are sitting in the courthouse in which uh, the first uh, international trial took place in Nuremberg, and we actually are conscious of this heritage. And our mandate is uh, upholding the Nuremberg principles by convening dialogues uh, and critical as well as sympathetic dialogues, being also nonpartisan that we share, uh, certainly uh, bringing practitioners to the law and the law to the practitioners and do research. Uh, all under the auspices and the umbrella of the Nuremberg uh, principles. Uh, I'm most grateful for uh, setting up this discussion round, which I think is extremely important. There is no more difficult task around the entire International Criminal Court than choosing the chief prosecutor. It is the only internationalized court or tribunal that a prosecutor serves for a period of nine years. It is uh, a court where the prosecutor enjoys significant independence. And uh, this is actually one of the benefits of uh, the court as well. So uh, the task is extremely dedicated and choosing the wrong person bluntly may harm the court significantly. So I appreciate the efforts that the Assembly of State parties have, have met. And I appreciate uh, uh, the efforts that uh, everybody has contributed in order to finding a prosecutor. What I do like is that the discussion about choosing the prosecutor was not overwhelmed by requests. It has to be a person that goes for crimes of a, a specific nature. It has to be a person that focuses on a particular geographical region. All that has been avoided, and this is, uh, from my point of view, an, an, an achievement. What remains to be, to be uh, done is, is setting up criteria that actually uh, someone can verify. And the discussion about the betting of the candidates is an interesting example. How would you bet these candidates? Uh, how would you practically do this? It's easy to ask for that. It's more difficult to implement that. And the more discussion we have about how we do this, how we achieve the common goal, which is undisputed, as far as I can see uh, the discourse, uh, the better it is. Uh, but it is and it remains a, a task and if I would have a wish, if I could ask the international community the, in the next round of election one thing not to do, and that would be from my point of view, not falling into a habit that you see very, very often in the multilateral world. And that is trading. That is a name uh, uh, in exchange for another name. That is interests in exchange for other interests. Uh, and we do know that these uh, trading in uh, is and has effects also on the appointment of officials in the highest positions. And if there is a worldwide campaign to urge the permanent members of the Security Council not to exercise their veto rights in ICL cases, there should be a second uh, plea to the international community in ICL cases not to fall into the habit of trade -off. I will leave it with that. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. And again, thanks to Silpa and to Charles for starting this important discussion.
Thank you. And uh, Klaus, that was wonderful to hear. And um, ASO has had the privilege of working with the Nuremberg Institute in the past and uh, certainly looks forward to doing so again. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon from uh, us here in the US of the American Society of International Law, although our members are actually fairly global as well. Um, allow me to convey first the personal uh, well wishes of our executive director, Mark Agrast, who couldn't join us today. Um, let me also say that uh, SILPA is an important addition to the community of organizations addressing research, policy, and practice on international and regional law. Um, Charles, this initiative of yours is something I think very timely and well thought out and well placed to contribute to the important work that organizations do um, in generating and enriching the conversations in the fields of international and regional law. And ASIL certainly looks forward to working with SILPA in the coming months and years. Um, ASIL strongly supports the efforts of organizations like SILPA and itself as we try to undertake critical review of our own international organizations. It's essential that independent organizations be willing to evaluate these bodies, even as we hope for their success, in order to make sure that they actually achieve their stated objectives. There's a lot riding on these bodies. There's a lot of pressure that questions whether or not they are essential or needed in competing budgetary structures and competing uh, political power structures and making sure that they perform at their highest level is a critical effort that needs to be undertaken and what SILPA is doing with this series promises to be an important part of that conversation, and certainly we welcome that. Uh, in light of that, I do want to mention real quickly um, ASIL's upcoming task force report on options for positive engagement with the International Criminal Court, which aims to present pragmatic policy options to decision makers in the U.S. government and civil society organizations. That report, for which Charles served as a member of the advisory group, um, will be released in April, and we look forward in, to holding public events where people can engage with that content, including, if I may be so presumptuous, Charles, with SILPA as well. Uh, but I am very much excited for this conversation to start off this uh, four-part series and um, to learn from the wonderful panel of experts we have before us. Thank you, Charles. Thank you so much, uh, Wes, and thank you, uh, Klaus. Uh, since you've all put it on the first name basis, I appreciate the uh, informality. And also, of course, for your words of uh, welcome and your collaboration in convening this important dialogue today, um, as well as on behalf of SILPA, this uh, possibility of a collaboration in the remainder of the three events uh, that we have coming up in the colloquium series, but also perhaps even outside of that, uh, giving our interest, as I said earlier, um, on issues of international criminal law, especially as they pertain uh, to Africa. Uh, if, if anyone wonders about the subsequent roundtables, we have a little bit of information about them on the website. Essentially, the next three will be focusing on the themes of the achievements of the current prosecutor, and very importantly, uh, the challenges of the next prosecutor, the prosecutor elect Mr. Khan. Um, and then, of course, a third roundtable will be looking at the ICC review and reform process. And then finally, of course, we want to wonder in the final discussion in the final roundtable, uh, whether this might be an opportunity in view of the leadership changes at the court for a reset of the Africa ICC relationship. And that kind of fits very nicely with the theme uh, that Wes mentioned in terms of looking at the US relationship with the ICC. So I just wanna mention at uh, those three events, do look out for them and uh, support them as well. Uh, because clearly you're interested in ICC issues. Uh, let me now move on uh, directly uh, to the panel. Uh, before I do that, just a couple of points. Uh, the first, of course, is that we have a very distinguished set of panelists and speakers. So I want to extend my deep gratitude to each and every one of them uh, for joining us to share their expertise. Uh, unfortunately, due to a personal issue that arose, one of the speakers could not join us, but we do have uh, three of the other speakers uh, who I will introduce uh, uh, momentarily. Uh, preliminary, I would like to also note uh, that we have agreed um, amongst us, uh, me in the capacity of moderator and the three panelists, that we will not have set presentations because in a way everybody is zoomed out <laughs> these days and we thought that we might make it a little bit more interactive and have a conversation between the legal experts. Uh, toward the end, I will ask each of the, uh, so as part of that, I'll ask each of the panelists a set of questions and they'll have about three to uh, four minutes to respond. And after about a couple of rounds, uh, we'll open it to the panel, uh, to the floor for discussions. Um, so at the outset, I would like to note uh, that there will be that possibility for you to put your questions through. 
uh, hopefully through the chat at the bottom. And also you can of course always request uh, for the floor. Uh, one important programming note is that we are recording the session. Uh, our hope is that we want to make this available uh, to others who may not have been able to join us this moment, uh, but can watch it at their convenience as part of that uh, transparency and public discourse that we are trying to uh, push forward. Uh, now on the theme itself, um, I'll just note that as you all know that in February of 2021, the prosecutor of the ICC was finally elected, uh, Mr. Karim Khan of the UK, uh, who I believe got about 72 votes just in the second round of voting. Uh, the selection process, as you all know, was uh, something that began way back when, so to speak, in about April of 2019, uh, when the Bureau of the Assembly of States Parties put in place a competency-based search process for the ICC prosecutor. Uh, unfortunately, due to uh, various circumstances, there was a little bit of suspense, if I may say, around the process. But in the end, I think the states' parties spoke clearly and selected an experienced candidate who will bring a lot uh, of international tribunal experience to the ICC. Um, in a critical respect, uh, the process, uh, albeit with some slight details here and there, concluded successfully in that the person that they selected was a participant in the competency-based search process, along with other finalists, of course. Uh, while it might have been ideal for consensus to be achieved, I do want to note that if you look at the Rome Statute, and we'll get into this discussion uh, momentarily, uh, the Article 42 basically con contemplates precisely uh, that you will uh, elect the prosecutor by an absolute majority of the state's parties. So from that point of departure, what has happened is precisely what the, 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 the Rome Statute contemplates, even though obviously we have some practices that started emerging, uh, whereby they will seek the consensus and made that almost a default, and we'll come to that uh, momentarily. I don't want to hold you up because I'm sure you're not here to listen to me, we're here to listen to the experts. And I'm very fortunate uh, to have a stellar lineup for you. Uh, let me uh, introduce each of them uh, based on the order in which they are listed in the program, uh, which is basically alphabetical by last name. So our first panelist is uh, Ms. Angela Modukuti, who is a Zimbabwean human rights lawyer specializing in international criminal law, currently working with the Open Society Justice Initiative. Uh, Angela has worked for a variety of organizations, including Human Rights Watch, uh, the Wayamo Foundation, and the Southern Africa Litigation Cent uh, Center, SALC, where she worked on precedent-setting cases, including issues of crimes against humanity and universal jurisdiction uh, before the South African Constitutional Court. Um, I think a lot of us know Angela's work uh, with the famous effort uh, by SALC to get former president of Sudan al-Bashir arrested in South Africa. Uh, but before she went to SOC to do just that kind of work, she had actually worked in the OTP of the ICC. And of course, uh, she, in a way, she's a very familiar figure because she writes and contributes uh, to the debate on issues of international criminal law, including, of course, with the fantastic blog, uh, Opinio Juris. The second panelist is uh, Sabine Nolka. Uh, uh, Ambassador Noka was educated at the University of Western Ontario and the London School of Economics and Political Science. She began her diplomatic career in 1992 as a junior counsel in the Economic and Trade Law Division of the Canadian Foreign Ministry. Uh, she, uh, since then, she specialized in international law in increasingly responsible positions with a focus on international peace and security, human rights, terrorism, humanitarian law, and international criminal law and I was a director general of the Non-Proliferation and Security Threat Reduction Bureau. Uh, she has been in diplomatic postings at the Canadian High Commission in London, uh, with the Canadian delegation to the OSCE in Europe in Vienna, and of course, I think more recently as ambassador of Canada to the Netherlands and the permanent representative to the OPCW and the international institutions in The Hague particularly relevant for our panel here today. Of course, she was the chair of the committee on the election of the prosecutor of the ICC. Our final panelist, last but not least, is Mr. Owiso Owiso. Owiso is a doctoral researcher in public international law at the University of Luxembourg. His doctoral research focuses on the sovereign authority of regional international intergovernmental organizations, specifically the EU and the AU and its application to the regionalization of international criminal justice. He has been a keen observer of international courts, particularly the ICC, and is a regular commentator 
on the law and practice of this court. So as you can see, we have a very, very rich, experienced panel. Um, so let me now get to the first bit of the conversation. Uh, we're going to essentially start off with some taking stock of where the Rome statute requires in terms of the prosecutor. But before that, I'd like to open the floor to any panelists uh, because the panelists were invited to give opening remarks. And I believe um, uh, Angela Modukuti was going to give some opening remarks. So Angela, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Charles. And thank you to you and all your sponsors for the invitation to participate in this very timely and relevant event. I think it's an important moment for us all to reflect on the past election cycle and to think constructively about how we can improve things for future elections. The Open Society Justice Initiative has been monitoring the election process very, very closely, and our work and advocacy on this issue is really to ensure that it is credible, it is fair, it is transparent, and that it is merit-based. And as Klaus highlighted earlier, that it is not a process that is characterized by vote trading, toxic campaigning, backdoor deals, but really is a process that focuses on the merits of the candidate. And all our work on vetting in particular has been guided by this this vision and these principles we have and this idea that this is how elections should best be conducted. So with that said, I look forward to this discussion and thank you once again for having me. Thank you so much, Angela, for those uh, opening uh, words. I know and a lot of us followed the work of uh, uh, OSGI in this uh, particular area, which was actually even before the process was put in place. So I think it's very, very important. I'm uh, going to back to that earlier point about engagement by civil society as key stakeholders, of course, including academia. Uh, so uh, let me uh, now uh, perhaps go to the first set of issues. If there is no other panelists who would like to uh, request the floor uh, to perhaps uh, talk a little bit uh, to uh, Sabine, uh, because of course, I know many of you are curious to hear from her, uh, given the perspective that she brings as a former chair of this uh, committee on the election of the prosecutor. And uh, before we do that, and of course, Sabine, you can start us off if you like, uh, no pressure, of course. Uh, since we are discussing uh, the selection of the ICC prosecutor, whose role is set out in the Rome statute, it seemed to make a little bit of sense to start by clarifying what exactly it is that the ICC statute requires for the ICC prosecutor and the office that she leads. Uh, of course, as we all know, the OTP is mentioned in Article 34C of the ICC statute as one of the four principal organs of the court. Uh, the functions of the OTP itself set out in Article 42, the Office of the Prosecutor, uh, which basically says that it's an independent organ that is responsible for investigating situations in terms of potential crimes within the court's jurisdiction. So I wonder uh, if any one of the panelists uh, would tell us um, from your perspective on Article 42 of the ICC statute, is there a particular profile for the ICC's chief prosecutor? And if so, how would you describe that profile in relation to the vacancy that was posted during the most recent search? Well, you, you put me on the spot, Charles, so I, I'll, I'll take the spot. Um, I mean, evidently, the, uh, the criteria and the Rome statute speak to competence and experience. Uh, they also speak to high moral character. Um, these are very general criteria. Um, so it leaves a fair bit of room, I think, for people to build the expectations around. And um, let me address a couple of those, I think, in the specific context that we found ourselves in. Uh, the competence aspect, uh, you said that uh, quite rightly, that the, uh, the new process that was chosen uh, for this particular election was uh, supposed to be a competency-based process. And that's why we had uh, the panel of experts, which was really a new development. Um, and and we, had, uh, we had the committee established to assess those. Now, that came out of discussions, I think, that had happened um, in The Hague, in New York, over the last few years, where questions had been raised about the professionalization of the, uh, of the OTP and the need to really have experienced 
criminal lawyers in there. Um, I think it's no secret that uh, there had been a couple of recent decisions where you know the evidence was assessed by the courts as being insufficient. And, uh, and I think uh, certainly in the conversations that I had in my role as ambassador in The Hague, I heard from virtually every corner of the planet uh, that um, there were concerns about just how professional the OTP was. So, so that was one particular criterion within the Rome Statute that we needed to give a bit more meaning to. And, and we looked at this as a committee jointly with the panel um, when we established the, uh, the vacancy announcement and really characterized the competencies that we were looking at very, very specifically. It's a two or three page, I forget, it was quite a long vacancy announcement. I mean, a lot went into that. And um, if you look at the article 42 versus that vacancy announcement, you can see that we really invested, I think the, the short general terms of article 42 with a lot of in-depth thought. So that's, that's one aspect. And, uh, and that is, of course, what, what we then did through the interview process and the assessment process and really very, very um, lengthy and detailed discussions between the committee and the panel on individual candidates, their background, their performance in the interview. All of that was really geared to one criterion and that was competency. Um, the, uh, the second criteria and the high moral character, that is the one where civil society got really engaged. And it, um, it led to, I think, um, certain expectations. Civil society in turn invested the high moral character with specific meaning. And really the one that, that gained, I think, the most traction and the most uh, generated the most discussion is uh, came out of the context of the Me Too movement and it looked at uh, conduct, uh, harassment, um, inappropriate sexual conduct and, uh, and all of these, uh, these aspects of, um, of high moral character. In other words, do we want to have a person who has a track record of uh, making sexual advances to interns? You know, so so that really informed that discussion, and to some extent, and having followed these issues on Twitter and having discussed them with civil society, that almost um, I think as far and I'd be very happy to be uh, corrected uh, by my civil society colleagues here, but it almost uh, became, and I'm using a frivolous phrase here. Please don't hold that against me. The tail wagging the dog. It really generated, I think, uh, a lot of discussion and therefore a lot of expectations on the, on the panel and on, on the committee. Um, and the expectation was that we would be vetting candidates for their past history in this context. Now that of course uh, created um, a, a huge gap between expectations and reality. And I think everybody sitting on this panel is, uh, uh, is a lawyer. And uh, you will understand that you can't just simply hold hearings, which is one of the things that NGOs demanded, hearings of these candidates where complainants could come forward. On what legal basis do you do this? You know, these are not people that have already been appointed. These are people applying for a job. So who is the body that is going to be responsible? Um, how do you establish due process without actually having a due process uh, regime set up for these things? So there was a vast gap between expectations and reality, I think. Um, so the high moral character, I think, um, was um, is, is clearly, uh, an issue, um, and it's it's a main criterion for the for the prosecutor. But how to actually establish it is a little bit tricky. Uh, we created um, a vetting process uh, to the extent that we could, um, which um, which involved criminal records checks, you know, social media history study. It involved um, detailed reference checks. Um, et cetera, et cetera. But that really was as far as we could go. Uh, and that was criticized, but 
you know, again, expectations versus reality. So, so those are the, the two main things, competency, high moral character. They're not very well refined. We did our very, very best to try and imbue them with, with meaning. Um, but throughout that process, I think we found ourselves running up against uh, expectations versus reality. Uh, finally, on the competency-based process, while uh, I think we uh, as a panel and committee group, uh, the, uh, the, the two different groups did a, I think a very thorough job of vetting competency um, based, including on, on things that we were told uh, states were looking for, um, found ourselves then subsequently criticized um, for it. And um, one example I would cite was that many of my colleagues in The Hague were saying things like, well, maybe we should get an experienced domestic prosecutor because they're the real criminal experts uh, and not more of the same old, same old that we've already seen in the international arena. Well, when we then produced our list, um, the, the first question we got is where's everybody we know? Um, so, so you, you're constantly running up against uh, the, uh, this dichotomy of uh, expectations versus reality. Um, the other question I think we, we got was, um, and, uh, and gender is of course referenced in the Rome Statute, not necessarily as a selection criteria, but when it comes to judges, a balance is required. Um, we got, uh, I think about a quarter of our applicants were women. And you know when you're starting to to skew your pools um, in that way, it 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 puts a crimp on uh, on on the selection. Um, so I think one thing, and maybe that's an, an opening statement I should have made, is that um, ultimately the Assembly of States parties has the has the role in selecting, electing the uh, the prosecutor. What we didn't see very much of is engagement by the state's parties to make sure that the vacancy announcement reached their professional organizations and reached their pool. We had very, very few applicants from Eastern Europe, from, from Asia. Um, so states really, if they want to select the most competent persons for um, as a as a pool of candidates, they also need to provide them, I think. And, and there's, there's a bit of a shortcoming there that, that uh, I found in the, in the process. States simply didn't do enough to you know, push the competent candidates. Some, some states did a bit too much, frankly, but, uh, but not, not, not all states uh, you know, circulated their, um, the, the vacancy announcement within their professional prosecutor organizations, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there has to be a little bit more, I think, if we want to really take competency seriously in, uh, in ensuring that the competent candidates are, are put forward um, for, um, for assessment. Thank you so much, uh, Sabine. And I'm sorry I put a little bit in the, on the spot there, um, but I don't think that uh, anyone has been denied anything but great expertise in terms of your role, uh, but also setting out the requirements of the, of the Rome Statute. Um, so let me ask, um, I have a couple other points that I could supplement from, but I don't want to make it sort of the perspective of those who were involved in the process. If there's someone else on the panel who wants to weigh in on this before I move on. I mean, obviously Sabine has raised a number of important points that reflected a bit of that debate about what exactly is the committee asked to look for and what exactly did the committee uh, return? Uh, how do you handle this sensitive issue of high moral character, which is actually formally part of the statute? And in fact, we see that character requirement in other parts of the Rome Statute in relation to other principles. And, and we've seen it also in other international institutions, but never really had any definition or specificity that goes beyond just saying high moral character. So in a sense, part of the, the challenge is the challenge of practice in terms of not having established any clear methods. But anyone um, on the panel who wants to weigh in on this question before I move on? Oh, so? uh, yes, sure. Well, I, I do agree with uh, Ambassador Malka that uh, there was you know, that, that sort of disconnect between expectations and reality. But then uh, I think one thing I would say about that is that we need to ask the question why 
we had the kind of expectation that there would be a thorough vetting in, when it comes to high moral character. Indeed, the Rome's Article 42 doesn't quite give much, and I must commend the committee for fleshing it out quite you know, extensively. But you know, looking at the, the advert itself, I, I looked at it again this morning, and it's very lengthy, but one of the very short parts of it is on integrity. That one is actually one of the briefest. And that, of course, tells us something about Article 42, not you know, being, being very vague on what high moral character really means. So yes, indeed, uh, there could be something to say about you know, expectations raised by civil society on high moral character versus the reality of you know, the, what exactly the, the exact power that the committee had to indeed engage in a thorough vetting of high moral, high moral character. But I, would, I, th I think the, the better question, I mean, at least from where I sit, is why exactly did we see this kind of expectation? It means that there is indeed, and there has been a problem with moral character. And, uh, and, and we don't need to go very far. We just need to go to the experts review report and we will see it. So the, the expectations of civil society and everybody else who's watching the process from outside, maybe they might have overwhelmed reality, but they were coming from a very good place, if you ask me. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Owe. So uh, let me just uh, uh, then go uh, so we can uh, uh, develop the conversation and come back, because of course, even the high moral character issue, we want to come back to it in a minute. At this point, um, uh, now we're going to Angela, who I also know has some views on this. Um, clearly, at this point, you have the statutory requirements, as uh, Sabine mentioned, Article 42.3, essentially with three takeaways. One, you have the element of high moral character. Two, you have the high competence and extensive experience in the prosecution or trial of cases. And then finally, you have this language requirement, which is excellent knowledge of and fluency in one of the working languages of the court. But as, as Sabine pointed out, these are very, very general. And notice that the experience requirement does not say national prosecution experience versus international prosecution experience. Um, the experience requirement or the competency requirement does not say um, that you know, the person, uh, clearly if the person was a prosecutor, they have in a sense a bit of uh, a, a, a clear case they can make, but obviously it doesn't say somebody who had worked in defense or even as a judge could not. And that of course is consistent with what had happened before where you had even candidates who had been judges who wanted to be considered. And then, there, of course, the additional points that I think that Sabine made, uh, where I think taking the cue from what the states were saying um, in the terms of reference, uh, mentioning the element of gender, uh, geographic representation, and adequate representation of the principal legal systems of the world. Uh, but that's about it. And I think it does go to a, perhaps a broader point about how detailed do you want the criteria to be when you are circulating an ad essentially for a job. And I would just note in, as a footnote to Sabine's point, I think it was a concern from the point of view of the committee that the pool wasn't sufficiently large that Sabine went back and asked for an extension of the vacancy announcement and then an encouragement to states to apply. So in a sense, if we're looking at the issues of what could be done, I think the states parties have to look at themselves too in terms of their role, both in developing the criteria, but also in disseminating the information. And I will note that what the panel and the committee uh, proposed as, as, as vacancy was actually approved by the ESP Bureau. So it's not that you have this unaccountable actor, so to speak, coming in and jumping in there and basically designing what they think is the right thing. Uh, but I do want to, uh, I know we'll come back to some of these issues. Um, obviously, um, I was going to pick up on a question about uh, that I had in the list of questions about whether, uh, how does the Rome Statute contemplate um, the, the processes of uh, electing the person and, and making a distinction between nomination on the one hand and election on the other. But maybe we could set that aside uh, just because we, we want to get to some of the other uh, uh, more, if you will, perhaps challenging questions. Uh, we could talk a little bit, if you like, uh, if anyone is interested in this in terms of what happened in the prior, uh, in terms of the practice. So, for example, how the first prosecutor was elected. Uh, which is actually a consensus that was found, but it's, it still was a vote. <laughs> so they actually voted, but they agreed before they went to the vote. So in fact, it's not correct to say that there was not an election before. Technically, there was an election. It's just that everybody had agreed who they would vote for before they went to vote, right? So it's interesting. Uh, but let me shift now perhaps uh, to uh, Angela. Um, actually, before Angela, to uh, Owiso, because we're talking about states' parties. So I'll go to Owiso briefly on this. Um, and then talk a little bit about the role of civil society and then come to Angela about the high moral character requirement. Um, so we saw from the point of view of the ASP and its role, what would you say, um, if anything, that could be done better from where you're sitting as an outside observer who follows these issues closely? Uh, 
uh, if I get you correctly, you're asking me from the point of view of looking at the AFP itself. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and perhaps even the presidency. What the role, presidency, yeah. if any, okay. did it play during the process? And is there something that they can do better from the point of view of uh, somebody who's following close to the process? Yeah. Well, I mean, from how I see it is that the, the AFP presidency has, you know, this uh, primary responsibility to shepherd the process. Because, you know, when, when, when you're dealing with states, it's more like adding, you know, not necessarily sheep, I don't want to say that, but adding diplomats. And all. So it has that obligation and that responsibility to shepherd, uh, to shepherd the process and ensure that it runs as smoothly as, as possible. And, of course, I, we, we need to commend the, the ASG presidency for, in the normal circumstances, it's very difficult, of course, to, to get 123 states, diplomats from 123 states to actually agree on anything. In fact, it's even hard to get them to agree that they need to agree on something, right? Under normal circumstances. But if the presidency was operating under abnormal circumstances, we had a global pandemic you know, ongoing. So when we, when, when we judge how the ASP presidency did what it's supposed to do, we need to have that in mind. But that said, of course, um, I need to say something as well, because you know, after giving them a little flattery, then we need to, be, to come back to the specifics. Did the ASP do well in shepherding the process? I don't think so. And why, why do I say that? Uh, the process dragged on a bit too long. And we, we observed why it went it dragged on a bit too long. I, I, this, I've had quite a number of discussions with a number of people on this. And I always come back to my original you know, statement that this process shouldn't have dragged out this long. We should have gone to an election as soon as it was clear that consensus wasn't going to be achieved. It was very clear sometime in late November that uh, states weren't going to achieve a consensus either on the short list or the expanded list. And I believe one or two countries from the African group had made and had drawn a line in the sand. And then uh, a few weeks later, a few states from Western Europe and other groups also drew a line in the sand. So I believe at that point, the presidency should have you know, just moved forward with letting states elect. So why, why is this a problem? Because dragging it on when it was very clear that there was no consensus created this sort of toxic environment where, you know, we, we saw the kind of campaign that, was, that, that, that unfolded towards the end and it created a lot of acrimony and a lot of, you know, the toxic environment. So in that regard, I think that the ASP presidency didn't do a very good job in shepherding the process. But then again, I come back to my original statement that when we say this, or rather when I say this, we need to have, in mind that it was an abnormal situation yeah thank you so much uh, Oviso, uh for that and um i i think it's a good point uh to say that there are both uh, contextual circumstances and other factors that may explain a little bit of what was going on here but let me just ask you on one other element before i go to angela because i know angela was very interested uh in the on the issue of uh the vetting and why it's important and so she's going to talk about that. What would you say about civil society and perhaps even legal academia? Was there a role for them in this process and what kind of role did they play? Um, is there anything that can be improved from that point of view? Yes, it, indeed, civil society has always played a role in the Rome statute system from the very beginning. And this wasn't any, it wasn't any more unique than the role they've played all along. And they've been very vocal on it. You know, I think some of, some, some of the adjustments that the, that the state made to the 2020, 2021 process you know, learning from the previous processes were largely as a result of civil society pushing very hard for it. So there was, you know, the civil society was as active as ever. But again, there's always something, there's always something wrong with processes that, um, you know, when you're used to doing things the same old way, there's always, there's always an element that we ignore. For instance, I would ask the question, what, who exactly or what exactly is civil society? If you look at the process, those who were very vocal in the process were international NGOs, for instance, they were very vocal in the process, you know, making very good, very good and very solid points, especially hammering down on the issue of high moral, moral character and vetting. But then in the process, they, it, that ended up drowning out the voices of local civil society organizations, civil society organizations, particularly from uh, situation countries. So at some point, we had a few civil society organizations from situation countries on the African continent, for instance sending in letters to the committee, I believe, and to the ASP Bureau. Then a week later, a different set of, of NGOs from situation countries sends another letter. 
contradicting the previous letter. So you could see that there was some sort of dis, uh, dis disconnect between them, there was lack of unity between, you know, between local civil society organizations, while the, inter the, the INGOs, international NGOs, were as vocal as ever. So there's this, as much as civil society played a very firm role as they always do, there's always that dynamic of who exactly is speaking for who. And then just finally on the point of civil society groups, when, when civil society groups purport to speak on behalf of persons or you know, survivors and people basically affected by the court's work, um, I have to ask myself the question, are they really doing that? If in, if, if, we see, if in the process we see their engagement is disjointed, are they, who are they really speaking for? And that goes for everybody else, you know, all other stakeholders, diplomats, you know, the rest of us who, who have observed the process. When we claim to be speaking for anyone, are we really speaking for anyone? And do we even have the authority to do that? And that, that, that is always a fundamental question. And then to close, we can touch a little bit on academia. I think that this, uh, the 2020 process saw a rather increased engagement from the academic community. And that is uh, principally because um, the academic community realized that we cannot engage in this, in, in this discussion through the traditional platforms of academic engagement, waiting several months, several years later to publish articles and old conferences. So in this regard, the new 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 platforms, emerging platforms such as blog blog sites like Opinion Eures, Digital Talk, uh, Mark Kasten, Justice and Conflict, Africa Law, were very fundamental in you know ensuring that the academic community contributed to this discussion because it was a very fast moving, you know, it was a very fast process with many moving parts. Yes. But again, because I've made it a habit of you know flipping things all the time. I observed one thing, but yes, as much as there was increased uh, in engagement by the academic community, which is indeed very good, but most of that engagement was coming from, you know, the academic community, the scholars based in the global north, either from the global north or based there. That was that is precisely where much of the conversation was coming from. So we ended up having a little, a little bit of an echo chamber going on here. I think moving forward, I think for, probably for the next, the future processes, I think it's upon the academic community to ensure that this conversation is all inclusive so that we have all voices from all over. You know, we, we be the global north or the global south. I normally have a problem with those technologies, but I'll use them here for convenience. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Oweso. I think these are really great points. And in, it's interesting that definitely from the civil society perspective, one could ask about whether. Uh, who who does the civil society purport to represent? No matter which civil so, so civil society it is, is it based in the global north or the global south? And then also the same could be said about um, um, academia. And I know uh, that there are some actually fantastic uh, symposia that started by a number of people, including Mark Keston and some other colleagues of his. Uh, and then of course, Opinio Uris with a big discussion online in the lead up to the process. And that's something that actually we were invited to contribute to Sabina and Anna. We thought even though we were in a sensitive position as part of the engagement, it would be important to explain the process. And the idea was to advance public understanding of what we thought the mandate was and what the mandate that were given by the Assembly of States parties. But Angela, you've been patiently listening to all of this, especially given the introduction that you gave earlier with the work of OSGI on this particular issue. Um, clearly, um, uh, there was some concern about vetting of candidates for the high moral character requirement, and that was something that was already raised a, a couple of times. So can you, Angela, develop that a little bit in terms of why is vetting of the ICC prosecutor candidates important? And should it, in your view, uh, potentially apply to the deputy prosecutor position, perhaps even other ICC principles, such as the judges and the registrar? Thanks, Charles. And absolutely, vetting should apply to all the principals, judges, registrars, deputies, et cetera, without exception. And I should really begin by saying that the CEP went further than has ever been done before when it comes to vetting for high moral character by having the safety and security section of the ICC conduct background and screening checks, et cetera. But as they note in their own report, and I like the way you phrased it, uh, Sabina, that this could not lay claim to comprehensiveness because there were limits to what you could do within the confines of your mandate, which is perfectly understandable. But then it falls to states, parties, and to the ASP and its leadership to go further and to actually fully and thoroughly vet candidates. And what do we mean when we say fully vet candidates? Which by the way, is a common practice in the corporate world and in governments with, when they're hiring for top level positions. This is not something new. This is something that has been done and continues to be done. And it includes things like conducting reputational interviews, seeking views from subordinates, former colleagues, current colleagues, supervisors, uh, proposing um, ways to obtain 
national criminal records. I know the CEP tried, but they didn't get everything before, the, before they had to issue their report, but pursuing that would be something that vetting would ensure. Creating a channel where people can come with complaints or allegations, where they'll be heard in a confidential and safe manner, and a duly constituted vetting body could then potentially investigate and determine whether these concerns raise, raise concerns about high moral character. Now, all of this has been done and is being done by professional companies, for example. So there are ways in which this can be done and it is up to the ASP to devise what works best and to work broadly with experts who specialize in vetting to make sure that this happens. And to go back to your question about why is it essential, it's, it's very simple and there, there are numerous reasons, but I'll just highlight four. Obviously the leaders in these positions have to be people of high moral character as per the Rome statute. And that includes not having a history of workplace misconduct. I and mean, we say high moral character is not defined, but there's some things that very clearly do not fit in the workplace, sexual harassment, bullying, et cetera. There is no argument about that. And the only way you can ascertain that is if you test their high moral character, you investigate and you allow people who may have something to say to come forward confidentially and with regard to due process. And as we know from the independent expert review, bullying and harassment is a problem at the International Criminal Court. And so something needs to be done and having leaders who can lead by example is very important for this. The second reason is that the court's reputation is also at risk, especially if it comes to light later down the line that there was information that wasn't considered when states were voting for an individual. And so we can't risk the court's credibility. We can't leave any stone unturned when assessing candidates and truly saying that we want to elect the best for this role. It's very important that you vet them thoroughly. And thirdly, and this is perhaps the most important point, is it's about protecting people who've been harassed or bullied or suffered any other harm at the hands of candidates vying for these top positions. They need a confidential and safe way to be heard. We know from the International Bar Association, they conducted a study in 2018 and they said that 75% of people who experience sexual harassment in the legal profession do not report for fear of retaliation. And that's exactly why a safe and confidential method for reporting is essential. We heard from people during the process that, oh, well, these people should just go public with their allegations. And this actually shows you that there's a, there isn't a complete understanding of the sensitivities around these issues, not just for people who may have been victimized in this way, but also for the candidates themselves. And this will be the last point on this. Betting is in the best interest of candidates themselves, because as we saw towards the end of this election cycle, there were numerous rumors on various social media platforms. And had we actually had a vetting mechanism, the situation may have been different. So everybody stands to benefit from comprehensive vetting that is done in a professional manner, that is impartial, that is fair, and that takes into consideration due process and the rights of all parties involved. It's not easy, it can't be done overnight, it does need time, but this is where the ASP needs to put steps in motion to make sure that this is a reality for the deputy prosecutor election and also the judges in 2023. Thank you so much, uh, Angela. And I can uh, assure you that even though the independent expert report had not come out uh, during this period uh, where we're involved in this process, we're very aware and followed very closely uh, the history of the court itself. Uh, I remember we had an early incident that went to the ILO. So, but let me go over to, uh, Dan, I think you all know what I'm talking about here, that led to us a finding against the court and even compensation being paid out in relation to that set of those set of allegations. I'm going to go over to Sabine, because I know Sabine, you were quite interested in this issue from the perspective of our own work um, in this processes, both on your side and the CEP and on, on our side on the panel of experts and even met, I think, with some civil society organizations in New York. So in your view, what, what was done? Can you amplify a little bit in terms of the the search and what you put in place that Angela, I think, referred to a little bit, uh, but also uh, some of the challenges in balancing that out with the considerations that uh, she ended on, which is fairness to the uh, to the other side, right? In terms of whatever you did, you have to be sure that the process is always fair to the to the candidates as well. Yeah, um, very happy to do that. Uh, again, that goes into the expectations versus reality. And uh, and Angela, um, you raised some very very good points on uh, the type of uh, vetting that can be conducted. Um, if that is part of the process up initial, 
In other words, if we can put into the vacancy announcement, the following steps will be taken uh, in order to ensure X, Y, and Z, uh, then that can be done. We didn't have that. Um, so we were, we were tied by the terms of our mandate and uh, in terms of the powers and the authorities that we were given by the state's parties, but also in terms of the expectations of the candidates themselves. Um, the candidates were not told that, you know, you can expect the following when you apply. So that, I think, is the really, really important, uh, important um, consideration to take forward. Um, you mentioned a complaints mechanism and a complaints mechanism within an organization is absolutely necessary. You get, I'm, when I was in The Hague, I, I um, was instrumental in bringing the International Gender Champions Initiative into, into The Hague and into the international organizations. So you can't find a more sympathetic a person, I think, than myself uh, on, on that particular score. Um, but, uh, but we also, like I said earlier in my first uh, statement, we're also lawyers and you have to understand the limits of legal frameworks. You can create a legal framework within an organization. You can say, if you misbehave, uh, and this is how we test your misbehavior, then the following consequences will arise. And somebody who enters into a contract of employment with that organization is bound by that framework. Uh, it's a different situation when you're simply applying for a job. Where does the legal framework sit? Where do the powers sit? You mentioned a complaints channel with due process. Well, who sets the due process for somebody who isn't even part of the organization yet? You know, it's, it's one thing saying that, you know, create an opening for people to complain and have due process, but how, what does the due process consist of? Do we have to have hearings? Are they elder and party? How do you conduct a hearing with somebody who's simply applying for a job? So, you know, we have to be realistic here and, and within the boundaries of what is actually acceptable under principles of administrative law. And uh, so, yes, by all means, have a vetting process set out very clearly what is being done. And frankly, most of the things that you said, we did. We did run the criminal records checks. Um, I think it was one candidate, we didn't get a response from, the, from their country of nationality. We did do uh, the reputational checks. We went into the organization or rather the uh, safety and security division of the ICC did uh, and uh, contacted individuals who'd worked with and for, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so all of these things were actually done. And, um, and then, of course, there was the bearing and the behavior and the responses of the candidates within the interviews themselves, which is something that um, we can't, of course, go into great detail about because it was a confidential process. But there are certain responses that, that informed the committees and the panel's view as well. And, uh, and so, so th there, there are many things that we did, despite the fact that we, had, that we had no clear mandate. So I think the improvement and the lesson learned that I would take forward is the next time we conduct a search, and this should also be, I think, in the call for nominations for other positions that the court puts out, say for judicial appointments, it should be right in there that candidates can expect the following to be done in order to establish this criterion. Um, so that is something that uh, I would very strongly suggest that the Assembly of States parties maybe form a committee of interested states to put some of those parameters in writing so that they can be taken forward. I think that would be a very useful response as well to, uh, to the reform process. Um, put it in writing so that, uh, that candidates know what to expect so that states also know what, you know what they can tell their nationals whom they might want to put forward uh, for a particular uh, position or, um, or, or spot. Um, so, 
clarity, I think, is absolutely mandatory. And, uh, and that, I think, will also create a bit more clarity of the expectations that civil society in particular can bring. Because uh, and I'll be very perfectly blunt, um, uh, Angela, one of the things that you suggested, that the channel for complaints, as a, as a lawyer with a, a background in admin, well, not a extensive background, but a government lawyer, I look at this and said, I can't do this. I don't have a legal framework. So unless the ASP were to create that legal framework, we can't, we can't have a complaints uh, procedure. It's just not realistic. But, uh, but everything else that can be done should be done. And in fact, uh, I, would, I would suggest, in fact, has been, had been done. Thank you so much, Sabine. Um, so I'll just pick up on a couple of points uh, from the conversation because I think there was a lot of misunderstanding in part because of the two-part nature of the process. One aspect was a public process. Another aspect was a confidential process. Uh, so the public aspect of the process was meant to come much later on uh, when the basically candidates were put on notice that at a certain stage, your identity will be known and everything will be public and so on. But on the confidential side, and you have to think about it from the point of view of job applicants, the candidates are guaranteed now that you'll be treating everything that they do with you confidentially. And in many of these processes, as we know, some individuals may actually be seeking opportunities and don't want anybody else in their organization, their current position to know that. So there's a sense that you have to balance also transparency versus confidentiality in terms of what you do. Uh, but the second point that I perhaps could just put a little bit of spotlight on is the fact that you are doing all of this on an ad hoc basis. So the legal basis is really from the point of view of the committee and the panel of experts was it where the terms of reference uh, that were given by the states themselves, right? That they agreed by the Bureau of the Assembly and uh, after negotiations, and then that became the template for all the work. So the question is, when you then have an ad hoc process, who is the support for that? And essentially it's the ASP secretariat. And inevitably, as we all know, considerations of budget and resources come in. So one of the early questions we had to deal with was, this is before COVID came along, was whether uh, we actually would anticipate a certain amount of time in The Hague to meet and actually discuss the process and then begin to do the work that was mandated. And already it was very clear from that point on, there was not gonna be a lot of resources, right? Now all of this became a little bit academic later on because COVID came into the mix and complicated things even further. And I'll just end on this point about um, the, the, the progress in a sense being incremental because if you look at the Rome Statute, all of these additions as we are having more prosecutor elections where we improve in the system are coming with election at a time. I'm not saying that's an excuse at all. Actually, as somebody who has seen the process, I'm very committed. And this is one of the reasons why I'm interested in even having and convening this kind of conversation. What could we do better to prepare now for all the subsequent? And I will completely agree uh, that elements such as having some kind of mechanism that are across the principles of the court, because after all, if nothing else, motivates it. I think there should be a lot that motivates it. The IER report is very clear, right? And of course, before the IER, we had the IDA's own work and a number of other organizations that have been involved in this issue. But let me uh, turn, except if there's any response. Okay, Angela, you want to respond? You respond, and then I want to go towards the last bit as we come towards the end of our time in terms of looking towards the future and what we could sort of see as at least some initial lessons we want people to start thinking about and contribute to Angela. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Sabine. I think we, we definitely agree on a lot. And just to be clear, I completely understand the limits within which the CPA, the CPE had to operate. And that is because you had a limited mandate from the Assembly of States parties. So really these points I raised really go more to the Assembly of States parties and the kind of mandate they give bodies such as yours, because you did exactly what you could have done and even went further than your actual mandate allowed you, which I think is commendable and very important for the role like this. But what I would only add is that, for example, with the, in our research on vetting and what needs to be done and in our consultations with professional companies that do this is that they've often had to establish a legal basis upon which, for example, with the reporting channel upon which you can receive a complaint and investigate that complaint. And that relationship, that legal basis has been created with, in this instance, let's say, for example, it would be the court itself. And But as you very rightly pointed out, candidates from the start need to know that this is part of the process. So I definitely think that there's a, there's a lot which the ASP itself and its leadership can do. Thank you so much, Angela. Uh, Sabine, did you want to add anything to this before I move on or 
That yeah, good? just just a very brief point on, on the very cogent point that you made, Charles, on confidentiality. I mean, that that I think is also something that uh, that really informed the process is um, candidates were supposed to be confidential. Um, some candidates made their candidacy known. And then you have already a little bit of an imbalance where lobbying starts to happen, whether it's in social media generally or whether it's through direct letter writing campaigns, etc. cetera. Um, so there needs to be, I think, a, a very clear expectation on what confidentiality means and uh, whom it, uh, it binds. And um, yeah, I, I think that I, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. It's the, uh, but it, uh, later on then, uh, and of course there's the speculation, you know, um, and that is something that uh, I'm, I'm looking at civil society here, you know, um, the, the suggestion that so who, who may be a candidate and then you get on these endless uh, discussions of, uh, you know, who should be a candidate. And I'm sitting there as, you know, as the chair, I know who the candidates are. And I keep wanting to say, but this person hasn't even applied for the job. Um, so, so that, but it creates this uh, expectation versus reality dichotomy again. So I think confidentiality is a, is a very, very important issue that needs a little bit more ex explanation, examination. And, and I think should also um, not just uh, be a shield for candidates, but should also not be used by them, you know, through breaches of confidentiality to create their own lobbying groups. Um, that might disadvantage other candidates uh, in turn who, who are considering themselves bound by the confidentiality of the process. So, so that I think is a, is a point that I'd, uh, I'd like to see also a little bit more explored. Thank you so much, Sabine. Um, so I'm going to move on um, towards the end of the discussion concerning practical suggestions and next, uh, uh, in, and next steps. Uh, that we uh, may contemplate. And I think that it's important to underscore that in the prior processes of the ASP, to its credit, they've actually gone back and done the lessons learned. And I think it's at this stage that it's appropriate to mention that hopefully, especially after all the wonderful effort that the ASP tried to accomplish by introducing more centrally than ever before, a competency-based search process that had the innovation of the panel as well, which is separate and apart from the committee. And we haven't got into the role of the panel. And we're happy to do that if we had a couple of minutes at the end, if people have questions about it. The point is we can always improve. And I think in this moment when uh, there's discussion about reform of the court, it might be a good moment also to shine a little bit of a spotlight in terms of reconvening that process to say maybe in another year or so, I think that's what they did after the election of the second prosecutor to then convene the lessons learned. So it becomes an official conversation among the states parties, at least as a starting point uh, to go forward in terms of redesigning and contemplating a process given the complexities that all of you are pointing to in addressing the high moral character requirement and all the different competencies that the states would want to stress. Uh, but let me now uh, open a set of questions to the panelists um, in terms of this process. And here, the first question really is, the CEP and the panel were created with a view to depoliticizing the selection process. Now, when you say that, some people might laugh at you because when you deal with states, it's very difficult to imagine whether you can depoliticize anything at all. But in any event, how would you propose as panelists, and I don't know because uh, uh, so you, you haven't had opportunities to engage more recently now in the sequence of the conversation, you wanna start us off, but how would you propose to take the politics out of the process, at least as much as possible, especially once the names of recommended candidates have been passed on to the state's parties? In other words, how do you get them to respect the competency? Charles, I think that's even when the politics begins. Yeah, and, and I mean, I would ask the question then, is it even possible to take the politics out of this process? I don't think it's possible. Well, and why do I say that? It's, the ICC is primarily an intergovernmental organization. I think that is often lost when we discuss the ICC and its processes and everything else. We tend to assume that the fact that it is an international criminal court means it's just that. No, it is primarily an intergovernmental organization. And as, and in, as, as long as states have 
the authority to elect its principles, there will always be politics. So I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't put the question that way, or rather I cannot answer that question, but I would say this, that instead of saying how can we, asking how we can take the politics out of it, we need to accept that the fact that politics will always be a part of this process. However, there's something we can do. We can at least insist on ethical politics in the process, a politics that de-emphasizes the vote trading that is characteristic of diplomatic huddling and emphasizes, even if, even if states engage in this diplomatic game, which they will anyway, but at the same time, they do not forget that the primary consideration they should be looking for is the competency of the candidate. So we cannot take the politics out of it, but we can insist on ethical politics in the process. That's a good point, uh, Oviso, and I guess you say the states have shown their investment in a kind of ethical politics by innovating the processes that they've been innovating to complement the Rome statute requirements by first in the second uh, prosecutor election having in 2011, a search committee uh, with a, a similar, not necessarily identical mandate with the second uh, committee on the election of the prosecutor, now with the added layer um, of a panel. Um, so I invite, I don't know whether Angela or Sabine, I want to come in on this um, on in terms of uh, the possibilities, <laughs> whether we could take politics or how much of the politics can we take out and how do we do that? Sure. Um, I'm happy to go ahead. I think, it, as Alisa said, it is difficult because it is an organization that is, you know, has state involvement and therefore political involvement. But I would say if there's more of an emphasis on merit, the actual merits of each and every candidate, states must ask themselves, does this individual meet the requirements of Article 42? And states must interrogate that candidate's vision for the office. And the best way to do that, I would suggest, is more engagement, more, more engagement with more of these candidates. So, for example, we had one round of roundtables. Perhaps more than that would be good to give states and civil society and other stakeholders an opportunity to engage with each and every candidate so we can really decipher their skills and their strengths and whether they do meet the requirements for the job. It's very difficult and this is also something that will take more time so maybe also that's a consideration. Perhaps more time is required for this entire selection process, something that states should also consider going forward. Thank you so much, uh, Angela. Um, Sabine, did you want to say anything about this? Yeah, I, I think um, you're right, Angela. There should be more time dedicated to actually presenting the candidates to to states themselves, but also to uh, to civil society. Um, I completely agree with you. A two-hour roundtable, I think, with you know, in the end, it was how many candidates? I uh, forget now, um, nine. Uh, it's it's just not enough. Um, so uh, so th that's one thing. I also agree with Oviso that um, taking the politics out by having states commit, perhaps via a, a ASP resolution or decision, not to engage in vote trading with respect to judicial and prosecutorial positions, I think that would be a very 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 good thing. Um, with regard to the politics themselves, I mean, they, they entered into the process, uh, frankly, um, the moment the list came out. And, and you're right, Obi, so that is when, you know, states, because there's an electoral role for them in the Rome Statute, that is absolutely necessary and you, you can't take, take that away. Um, what uh, I think um, does, states should take into account though, is um, if they're put into place a competency-based process is to honor that process. Um, I mean, perhaps uh, I feel my own toes trod upon, but literally the moment I had, we had the first discussion with states parties, the accusations of bias started to flow. And, uh, you know, you, the, the committee was accused of being biased, uh, I think, on the basis of gender, on the basis of language, uh, on the basis of um, legal systems. Um, I was personally accused of machi machinating everything to make sure that there was a Canadian candidate on the list, which is absolutely ludicrous because I I'd never met the man, I still haven't met the man. And of course, uh, I was recused from all the deliberations. But, uh, but it's that, that element of politics that, uh, that really, uh, I think, um, makes the process uh, 
uglier than it needs to be. So states need to look at themselves, I think, and how they conduct the polit politics. Um, what lobbying do they engage on on behalf of their candidate when, when they know that they're supposed to be selecting on the basis of competence rather than on the basis of nationality? Um, so a commitment, I think, to, um, to competency should be really uh, made by states. And, uh, and as Oviso um, said, a, commit, a commitment as well to, uh, to not engage in the vote trading because that really makes it, uh, makes it more difficult. I, I do disagree to some extent with you, Orisa that, Orisa, that the court is primarily an international organization. It is both. Um, it is both a court and it is an international organization. And it's where the two um, intersect that you have the greatest problems, I think, within the ICC, is where, where states think that they can uh, influence certain decisions because the court is an IGO as opposed to a court. You know, that's, that's where the frictions happen. And, and elections are clearly one of the deepest intersect points. And the lines need to be a little bit more clearly drawn and need to be clearly drawn in writing by a decision that the states themselves agree to. Thank you so much, Sabine. And perhaps I could just say a couple of quick points that build on the conversation that we've been having. Uh, which is in a way a recognition by the states uh, of the nature of the ICC as a court of law that's supposed to be independent, which was to distinguish between uh, the process of nomination and the process of election. So the ASP adopted a couple of resolutions on this issue, basically setting out some rules that would apply when it comes to the nomination and election of the prosecutor. And essentially they brought in uh, mutatis mutandis, uh, the process that was meant to apply to the judges uh, with a slight amendment for the prosecutor uh, nominations to be made with the support of multiple states parties, which is not a requirement in respect of uh, the judges. Uh, the second part of that, which deals with the elections uh, addressed in Article 42.4 of the Rome Statute, uh, where essentially the default position is that they would elect the prosecutor by the absolute majority of the members of the ASP. Uh, but what they did was when they adopted resolution two from the second ASP uh, was to reverse the requirement so that instead of referring to the same rules for judicial elections, they emphasize that every effort shall be made to elect the prosecutor by consensus. So essentially reverse the statutory presumption on the basis that you want the wind behind the backs of the new prosecutor when the prosecutor comes in, essentially with the support of a larger group of states parties. But here's the reason why I was getting to those points, which is the point that both of you have made, uh, Angela and Sabine, in terms of the vote trading. The judicial elections process now expressly says to states, we discourage you from doing vote trading with this, right? So presumably that means because states are in this mindset about thinking about how to strengthen the process, at least if we get a review of this to say, okay, can we also grandfather the same requirement into the prosecutor election process? But very importantly to Sabine's point, make very clear that it's not okay to campaign for candidates until the process is concluded, right? Because then we saw so at least media reports that suggest that countries are already getting ahead of the process by canvassing for their candidates. I should note, of course, that this is not a problem of the ICC per se, it's something we see in the national organizations elections generally, but it does mean that as you're trying to into this competence, you have to understand the wider context of multilateral institutions where states, I mean, even for the ICJ, countries are vote trading. I mean, gosh, right? Like if you can't get that out of the, the system at the level of the ICJ, then you have a big problem, right? So essentially it's a wider phenomenon in international law. Uh, about this. Um, anyway, uh, let me uh, bring it because I know we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, we started a little bit late, so I was going to give a little bit of flexibility in terms of the way we handle uh, the questions. And I do want to get to the, uh, the, the queue to see if there's anyone there with questions before I turn it over uh, to uh, Mark Kesson, who's been very, very patient, listening very, very carefully to all of this because he has a rather easy task, I should say, of kind of summing it up and taking away at least two or three lessons for us. So I'm going to invite, uh, if there's anyone who wants to ask a question, 
um, to put, uh, I don't see any questions at the moment in the chat, but perhaps this is an opportunity to do that. Um, so I can put it to the panelists. If you want to specify it to a particular person, please feel free to do so. If you want to send it to all of the panelists, it's of course your call. Uh, but basically I invite uh, to the wonderful audience that we've had, uh, patient audience that we've had, if you have any questions uh, in light of this very rich conversation uh, that you want to post to the panelists. Okay, I haven't, I haven't seen anything um, at this point. And Ashira, do assist me in case there's anything uh, there. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, there's, a, I think, a first question. So I'll ask this question. I think it's from Kevin Heller. Um, so Kevin's question is, and thanks to Kevin. Kevin stayed up very, very late in Australia to, to be part of this. I was exchanging emails with him. I felt pretty bad of the time zone. It was 1 a.m. before we start. I'm sure it's 2 going to 3 a.m. So definitely he deserves a question. So Kevin asks, given how much more controversial the situations at the ICC have become, Will we ever see another prosecutor elected by consensus? Will we ever see another prosecutor elected by consensus? Who wants to take this one? Easy question, of course. Uh, Sabine? No. <laughs> that was an easy one. So you have a one word answer for Kevin. No, probably Kevin knew that. OK, other, other, other naysayers in particular, other voices on this. Will we ever see another prosecutor? Or we so? <laughs> Well, I agree with them, Ambassador Noga. No, I don't think we will. And to add, I don't think it's a bad thing. I've, as I've been insisting the past couple of months, voting is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, I do believe that consensus is quite overrated. And as I said earlier, you know, dragging the process out, you, you know, in pursuit of an elusive consensus simply creates a very toxic environment. So yeah, we are most likely to see more voting going forward. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It could actually be, you know, sign of a of an ASP that is maturing, really. Yeah, if I could just add to my very brief no, um, the committee itself was tasked in its terms of reference to operate by consensus. And that, of course, fed into the list that we put forward to states parties. And uh, in that very first meeting, the one I referred to in terms of, you know, the various biases we were accused of, uh, one, one of the interventions that was made as well was, you seem to have overrated consensus. If you, if you think, you know, you needed to base your list on entirely on consensus, consensus is overrated. It was intriguing that the state party that made that comment was actually one of the co-drafters of the terms of reference. Um, but by the by, uh, consensus is overrated, I think, in this particular context. So, so I certainly ag agree with that. Uh, coming also from, uh, as you mentioned in, in my bio earlier, that I used to be at the OSCE. And the OSCE is a consensus-based organization. It's an organization that includes both the Russian Federation and the United States. So I, I can guarantee you, your consensus isn't a thing that happens very often. And, and I think in, um, in this particular context, um, you know, consensus, I don't think, is achievable. Uh, and, and shouldn't be the primary guiding principle. Thank you so much, Sabine. And on that note, I would just say, basically, maybe it's the attempt of the states to take it up to having a consensus system, but essentially statute requires nomination of the election by an absolute majority. So maybe your point about making the consensus uh, is critical. So Angela, I think you get to have the last word on this if I go to Mark. Uh, yes, just to say this ties into what Sabine just said and also your previous question, Charles, about when, when the politics actually starts. And I know Ouisa says it starts when the list has been revealed, but actually I think it starts before then. And it's simply because, as Sabine mentioned, states draft the terms of reference. So when they handicap the CEP or the panel of experts, the politics have already started there, I think. And I think that that time as well needs to be given consideration to the power they give bodies like the CEP. I think there's also a political element in that as well. Thank you so much. Very, very important point uh, that you raised, uh, Angela. 
Um, well, I feel bad because I, I was going to try to have more questions for our wonderful speakers, but unfortunately, given the time now, um, I should bring it to a close. Um, as I said earlier, uh, Mark uh, has kind, had kindly agreed to uh, basically do the most difficult task of pulling, pulling all of this together uh, with the closing. I promised him 10 minutes. He's going to get it 10 minutes if with your permission in the audience. Uh, if you don't mind. Uh, but let me introduce him briefly. Of course, he doesn't need much of an introduction. A lot of the people in the audience know him already, but Dr. Mark uh, Kestian is a consultant at the Wayamo Foundation and a fellow at the uh, Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Uh, he is the author of the book and the must read IJ blog, Justice in Conflict. Uh, Mark so kindly, as I said, accepted to listen in to the discussions. He was one of those who followed it very closely and I think helped to pull together one of those early symposia actually on this issue along with Kevin Heller and a number of others um, to provoke a discussion around it. So I thought it's quite appropriate for him to have a platform as well to share his own thoughts now that the process has concluded. Mark, please take it away. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much. I mean, it, it is not the easiest thing to try and pull together such a rich and um, and sobering discussion, and I think that's that's a really um, a great fact of this this discussion that we have is that's been a very um, a, a very sober one. And of course, when we talk about a post post mortem, we're suggested of something um, that we generally feel bad about, right? Something went terminally wrong in some ways. But I think it's also useful, um, as some have already done, to stress that a lot of things uh, either went well or certainly went better than before. And I think the ICC has done better um, in its elections and the ICC prosecutor elections than some traditionally democratic states have actually done in recent years. And at least the momentum is going in the right direction, right? Which you can't actually say about lots of other entities. Um, and rather than being the subject of kind of a postmortem, I think we should take Angela's invitation from the outset that this is an important moment to reflect and think constructively on how to improve things in the future. And so I wanted to, uh, organize my remarks around three things. So what happens, um, who is uh, and was part of this conversation and, and where do we go? So what happened, I think we've we've heard today a lot of different um, views on what happened. Ambassador Nolke spoke about this expectations gap and the gap between expectations and reality. Um, we heard about as the shepherding and the, or the non-shepherding or the, the wrong shepherding uh, of the Assembly of States parties. Um, and I think I, th I think all of this points to perhaps the need to have a deeper conversation, and this this event was certain part of it, or stock taking as to what happened uh, and why. One thing that uh, I was that was that was obvious through this process was the level uh, of confusion around whether the goal of the process was a particular outcome or it was to produce a fair process, uh, and that was at times I think very frustrating for people. Um, and I think most people here would agree and, and kind of um, thinking through the remarks that, that the participants and panelists made that the flow of information at times about the election and about the candidates wasn't overly good. Um, for example, uh, you know, I think, um, I think somebody mentioned this, it really felt like the process bit of the process was abandoned after the shortlist was announced. And, you know, Kevin John Heller and others rightly pointed out that, you know, adding new candidates was totally within the lines of the process. And this, this caused a lot of confusion, right? Is the, is, is the process the one that we, you know, we've, we expect, or is it the reality of the kind of, um, you know, the bylaws or whatever it may be that the ICC um, has, and, this, I think, caused some confusion as, again, to the purpose of this ICC election process. Uh, here too, after the shortlist uh, was announced and some states decided consensus just wasn't going to happen uh, and that they didn't like, because essentially I understand that they didn't like the list, the issue of transparency really suffered, right? And there was a consistent sense, I think, from June to, fe to February that certain states behind closed doors were you know, really running the show and it was really hard to know who exactly was running the show and why they were running the show or trying to run the show or guide the process in the ways that they were. Which leads me to the question of who what is in this conversation and has been part of this conversation. So what, what I found so great about our uh, event today is that we heard you know, Angela's viewpoint from civil society, Ambassador Nolka gave kind of the state diplomatic perspective. And then we have the academic uh, observer uh, viewpoint from OISO. And I think really the the we really matters here in terms of who, you know, getting all of these bits 
um, of the, you know, the ICC community in a sense together to have this conversation. And I do have questions about this, right? Who, who was watching this process and who was not watching this process? Who believed that the election mattered and, and why did they think it mattered? Who wanted to be part of the election? Who didn't and why didn't they want to be part of the election? I was very struck and I know we've talked about this elsewhere. Uh, Ambassador Nolke, you mentioned it that I think only one quarter of the candidates that applied were women. And this seems particularly problematic for a body of international you know, justice um, and should be a cause for really critical reflection. Why did only so many uh, women apply? Why don't they want to apply more for uh, a job like the ICC prosecutor? Um, I think we need some 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 real critical thinking into to why this was the case. Oisa also made the really important um, point that the conversation primarily happened in the global uh, north, and I think it's an open question as to how we get or why why our community didn't do as good of a job in getting other parts of the world more interested in the ICC, including their critiques of these kind of processes, right? Um, and the the election, I think, could have been a really exciting uh, opportunity to build understanding and support for the ICC. And I don't think it ended up being that. And so I think it was, to a certain degree, a lost opportunity to kind of advertise the court and its future and its work. Um, at the same time, I think it's notable that um, it was the biggest proponents of the ICC that probably had the most significant issues with the election process. And I think for those studying the court, that's a rather unusual and interesting fact. Um, the most severe critics uh, were of the court weren't really part of the debate and they weren't really part of the criticisms of the process, at least not visibly. And I, I think that's rather curious. Um, and that leads me to a point that it's important to always to see the forest for the trees, right? I think we need to be more self-critical within our ICC community about um, you know, whose voices are heard most and be open, open to the fact that there are very different interests within this ICC world and this ICC community world, some of which may not be uh, compatible. Oiso and Ambassador Nolke have noted that there remains a tension between those who view the ICC as a court and those who view it as an international organization or both and where those intersect and what tensions or issues arise as a result. Um, and I think the ICC prosecutor election was fascinating in the sense that it exposed just how much of an international organization the ICC is and how far the ICC as a court is from the election process. Um, and this is an uncomfortable fact, uh, I think, for many, because it means that we have to work with political entities, namely states who may or may not care about issues like vetting or transparency or whatever it may be. And it's really hard to change states, right? Uh, one thing they do is horse trade as a matter of habit and um, as a matter of, of, of history. And so I agree with Klaus uh, who mentioned at the outset that we should ask states to minimize this, right? We should ask them to minimize horse trading. But at the same time, you can't really stop, you know, um, a state from being a state. So the question then I think becomes is how do you get the right states involved? And there's sometimes a sense that I get at least, and I know others have mentioned, have, have noted this, that if we just get rid of states or turn states into human rights NGOs, we'd be able to get the right process in place. And I actually think that may be true, but it's just not possible or practicable. Um, instead, I think we should, uh, we need more information on what happened from the side of states. It's amazing, like we, we still don't really know the full story of what states did or didn't do behind the scenes precisely because it was behind the scenes, behind closed doors. So we don't know enough about where states stood on process and candidates, where they stood on transparency, vetting or consensus versus election, um, or which, which pushed um, hardest against horse trading um, versus their narrow agendas. And I think we do need to know this in order to know where we go next, which brings me to my third kind of uh, theme, which is, you know, where do we go? Um, and my sense is again, and this is to echo kind of Angela's uh, opening remarks that there, there is something of an opportunity here. And I think it's really important that we're talking about what happens next right now, just after this uh, last prosecutor election. Civil society engaged in this previous ICC prosecutor election really early, years before um, 
the actual election or the election process took place. But we can, and it seems obvious that we are starting even earlier this time, right? We're starting at almost at point uh, zero. And so we have nine years or almost nine years to get a better process in place. Um, and I hesitate here because I'm not sure the ICC needs more expert groups um, or more kind of outsourcing of committees or whatever it may be. But perhaps actually an expert group would be useful to do a genuine stock taking of what happened during the ICC prosecutor election. I think it's at least worth con considering whether we want something like this to draw lessons and recommendations and we have the people to do precisely that. I would suggest that the people who were on this panel are an excellent starting point for such a committee or expert group. And that could help build a co coalition of some kind, right? And I think people have mentioned this throughout the panel of getting the right kinds of states and actors on board to work together. And for if anyone needs inspiration, I think we can look at the Rome statute negotiations, right? And the, the creation of the group of like-minded states that worked so effectively with global civil society to push for the most progressive elements that exist in uh, the Rome statute and to kind of soften the effects of horse trading between in particular powerful uh, states. And there is time now to build that kind of coalition and have it you know, harness and to get things out on paper, as Ambassador Nolka said, to kind of lock things in a little bit. And then I think the likelihood of acceptance and state uptake of recommendations is probably higher now than it will be just a year or two or three before the election when they start thinking very critically uh, about what they want and their own self-interest. So doing uh, this would make it potentially less likely that uh, others come in later to blow up the process. On election design, I really, this is just a recommendation I have, which I think we can look outside of ourselves to think through um, who else to invite into this conversation. One thing I think we should try to do as a community is talk to election ex election process experts, right? Because in some ways what happened with the ICC election process is unique to the ICC. And in other ways it might not be, right? And it might be useful to kind of think our, outside of our community to engage people who know how to design elections in organizations and states and communities. On vetting, of course, Klaus said it's easy to ask for, but hard to achieve. Um, but most important things are, right? And there's not, there's literally probably nothing more important than ensuring that candidates are of high moral character, as Angela said, uh, and not someone with um, a history of belittlement, sexual harassment, or assault, or worse. Horse trading, of course, again, really hard to address. Oiko uh, spoke about how consensus is overrated. So did Ambassador Nolke. Um, Part of the problem I think that we're learning is that consensus does not inspire transparency and that those two goals might be uh, intention and this, the, the panelists spoke to that. Um, but if we are going to move towards electing the next prosecutor, I think we should do that with open eyes and knowing what the costs and benefits of that are too, right? Because elections are can be problematic as well. The benefits seem pretty clear, right? Elections can minimize horse trading by increasing the cost of backroom dealing especially if they're open and they can bolster transparency. But there's an open question. Do we want only the ICC prosecutor election to be done as, a, as an election rather than consensus? Or would we want budget negotiations to be done by election too? Would this kind of election you know, sentiment or this election process perhaps, perhaps spread within the ASP to areas that we wouldn't want it to? To conclude, I think the overarching question is whether the ICC wants to be, and we as a community within the ICC or the broader ICC world, want the court to be uh, a leader uh, in something greater than itself, in the democratization of elections within international organizations. And I think it has the opportunity to just that, to do just that. And I thank you, um, uh, Charles, the center and everyone for uh, the reflections, because this is such a great uh, starting point, and I look forward to working for hopefully at least eight years on making sure that the ICC is that kind of leader. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, and thank you on behalf of the uh, Center for International Law and Policy in Africa, uh, the International Nuremberg Principles Academy, and the American Society of International Law, to all the wonderful uh, uh, panelists. Um, I think we've started a conversation 
we have not ended the conversation. The idea of doing this now was as, as Mark was just putting it to we'll start from ground zero and we have a lot of time to think through all the elements so we can do better next time. I'm very optimistic from my personal point of view of what I've seen in terms of the progress of the court on this process. Definitely no process is perfect, but I think no human institution is perfect. So let me thank the, the speakers again and the audience that's been very, very patient with us. And we'll invite you to follow the subsequent round tables, a big round of applause for all of you. We'll post this online. Or hopefully other people can benefit from the conversation that we've had here. And then we'll be following up with our information on the subsequent events. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, evenings, and mornings for some of you who stayed up so, so late to listen to this. Thank you very much and bye for now. Thank you. Thank you so thank nice you. to see everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so. Bye-bye. Bye. bye. bye.